Fellas, look, I, I know you don't respect me as a police officer. Not true. I'm not stupid. I'm not Bro, going to come discharge on, my firearm in the office. Gamble, listen to me. I'll try to make it real clear. We yeah. honor the flag, and you crap on it when you don't shoot your gun in the office. Jimmy. Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. You know, I, I've done a couple of videos recently with, with Timothy Lim, a freelance uh, artist. Uh, he's a good guy, friend of the channel, and we're, we're glad to have him back along with his creative partner, Mark Pellegrini, to talk about your current project. How are you guys doing? It's an honor to be here. Thank you for having me on again, Wes. Oh, yeah, it's been a little bit, but it's great to be back. Yeah, so you guys just launched your, your newest campaign uh, last week. It's doing really well. Tell everybody about Cayman America and, and, and what that, that comic book's all about. Oh, well, first off, sir, it's pronounced Common America. Sorry. <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> He's just trying to protect himself from the, the weebs out there who will call foul. <laughs> <Right. laughs> well, actually, point of order, sure. It's <laughs> pronounced Common. Well, the general idea of the story is that it's basically the story of a small town girl with big dreams. She wants to be a fashionista someday. She wants to sew clothes. And to do so, she takes any venue that she can to reach that goal. So she works for USO as a costume designer and as a dancer. And basically, there's a freak accident that occurs, and she gets you know, kind of these otherworldly powers. And what we're looking at with this story is what happens when that occurs in a world where um, these types of events don't happen too often. Everyone comes after you. They want your attention, whether that be agents wanting to sign you up and get you promotions and sponsorship, whether that be, that be the military trying to get you to sign up and be like their personal guinea pig. And uh, the people who basically see what you're doing, and it's like, well, it's obvious. You should be a superheroine. So we explore what it's like tackle all of that as well as like what happens when you're faced with having to choose principle over profit and i think that that's kind of like the the moral the moral heart of the story is um, what does this good-hearted person do when just bombarded with all of these people telling her what to do with what she has and along the way she's going to fight some giant monsters and um a bad guy from a foreign land so there's a lot of action in it too so it's not as heavy-handed as it might seem you know, so I, I think you guys are, are somewhat known maybe for, for political satire and parody. Is this comic going to be like in that genre or is this uh, – are you guys uh, stepping out maybe no. doing something more like Black Hops? It, so this one actually I'd say falls in between our political satire books, which are pure comedy, and Black Hops, which despite having um, – a crazy premise is played straight. That one's more of an action drama. This falls in the middle where it has a sense of humor. Um, we have a lot of uh, funny gags and a, lot, and a lot of quippy dialogue in it, but it's not um, a satirical mad magazine kind of comic like uh, Walmart and, and those books, but it's also not uh, really dark and intense like Black Ops. It's, you know, the best of both worlds in a way. Uh, one of the things I've noticed when, you know, when I've, I've been reading your comics, you know, for, for quite a while. I, I read uh, My Hero uh, Magadamia. I've read Black Ops. I've read Walmart, you know, second term. I've read the, read the, well, I should be reading the second Black Ops soon. Hopefully that arrives in the mail. But I'm seeing a lot of growth, uh, you know, from both of you as, you as you guys go on over time. You know, Tim's art's getting a little bit slicker. He's kind of stepping outside of his, his uh, comfort zone. And I see, See, uh, especially Mark's dialogue is getting better. You know, Tim, what is it what that Mark is doing to really up his game as far as his dialogue is and his, and his transitions and narrative? I think one of the things that we're doing that's kind of different is that we're known for doing the funny stuff, like the political parody and the satire. But uh, sort of with Black Ops, we were dipping our foot into playing it straight where we were kind of, kind of having our cake and eating it too, where Black Ops has the same tonal vein as Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, kind of a ridiculous premise uh, in the beginning. But then when you read it, you realize that we're actually playing it as a straight story. We're not really going for laughs. And I think editing books like Soul Finder has helped too, because it means that we've had to step out of our comfort zone and do things that are more serious. And I think Common America, in a way, is the culmination of all of that because uh, we're able to kind of tell a story that is, it's also naturally funny because of the character um, of Carly Vanders, who's our main character, who's common America. But we also have a very deep moral story that we want to tell and we want to make sure that we can elicit that. So there were actually times in our script um, when I was drawing it and I was going over the script nightly where I would tell Mark like, Hey, um, we have a lot of, 
comedy in here right now, but it just occurred to me, we need this emotional punch. And it got to the point where we we're able to kind of call it out on a technical basis where it's like, we need to allocate two pages to this. We need to allocate four pages to this. And he would come back to me and say, well, we can't allocate um, four pages to this because that might be overstepping it, or we're going to be stepping into this action scene somewhere. Let's dial it back down. So it was this kind of like technical back and forth of how do we measure and weigh um, our intentions as far as what's appearing on the page. So obviously for me, it's challenging because I have this kind of cartoony style, but I need to temper it with something that's more heartfelt and emotional. Whereas Mark, who's used to writing like comedic bits, has to actually like kind of um, dig deeper and actually try to convey things that are more emotionally weighted and not so reliant on comedy uh, to execute them. You know, that's awesome. It, it really sounds like uh, you two collaborating together and really communicating is what's elevating both of you and in, in, in both of your games. Because, you know, I've seen, like I said, Tim's art has gotten so much better over time. He's so much more refined. You know, he started out as a commercial artist, but, you know, your, your uh, interior art's really taken off. You know, is that what you've seen as well, Mark? Uh, so Tim's style is always like changing. So I think uh, one of the great benefits of Tim's career starting out uh, with marketing, doing T-shirts, you know, doing licensed work for Hasbro and, and Marvel and Star Wars and Ninja Turtles mm -hmm. is that you had to draw in dozens and dozens of different styles. You had to maintain the, um, the style guides of the different brands and sometimes the sublines within those brands. Like he would do Ninja Turtles. Sometimes you have to do the Mirage style turtles. Sometimes you have to do the 1987 style turtles. Sometimes you have to do the modern turtles, each with their own unique style, despite being the same brand. And he's brought a lot of that to uh, the books we've worked on. So like Soul Finder doesn't look anything like Common America. And Common America looks very distinct from Black Ops. Um, all are by the same artist, but each book is a different genre. And each book has art that that fits that genre and the tone of the story that's being told, even though it's all by the same artist. And you'll you'll know a lot of artists don't have that kind of versatility. It's because a lot of those a lot of artists didn't have that background of working in like licensed art, you know, having to draw a hundred different styles a day as part of their career. So Tim's definitely uh, used that to his advantage. You know, at this point, you know, I I, I sent out a tweet uh uh, last week, I think, or I basically called you guys the gold standard as far as uh, uh, production and distribution for for crowdfunded comics. I might have uh, overstated that. You know, Brian Polito's still out there. He, may, he might be the gold standard. <laughs> the gold standard is Doug Tenable. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, Doug's still out there. But you guys are, are right up there. You've, you've got this all down to a science. So I, I really like the idea that it, with this campaign, you decided to, to maybe go out your side of your comfort zone as far as uh, marketing and production and stuff so you know there's there's been weird turf wars you know about indiegogo versus kickstarter and you know you did something different this time and you actually launched common america via kickstarter how did that guys how did that go for you guys well first of all let me edify you here for a second so that your your listeners know we do have wes from thinking critical to thank he was he, whether he knew it or not he was the deciding vote on whether to do it or not i had approached him and i said there are creators who have done kickstarter and indiegogo and they're telling me i need to do kickstarter but what it boils down to is efficiency and timing of fulfillment. I want a fast fulfillment. And I feel like Kickstarter is actually going to be a wrench in things because I've never done it before. I don't even know what any of the wait times are, or anything of that nature. What would you do? And Wes, who is not a creator, he is a consumer. So in that sense, you're a consumer advocate. You, you unequivocally said, yes, you need to do Kickstarter. Like there is no argument. You just have to do it. I said, okay, well, you're basically the deciding vote in my head. So let's just do it. And it's been very great so far. Um, we've learned a lot of things, and that's kind of topic for another channel. We did learn that there are definitely two different audiences. You have your Kickstarter audience. You have Indiegogo. On the other side, there is some overlap. You have people who don't really care about any type of loyalty to one or the other, but the Kickstarter market is 100% 
different from the Indiegogo one. I get messages for the last uh, 72 hours from people who have never heard of me before. And they see our books like Black Ops. And one gentleman, in fact, he, he paid Mark and I a large sum of money and he said as a pledge. And he said, I, can you please mail me your library of books that you've done in a graphic novel format? And so I, tomorrow, that's what I'm having to do is I have to go to the post office and mail those books to him because he wants to check them out. And so that that's really exciting. And they've been very friendly, very cordial. But this is that robust market that people have been talking about. Kickstarter has been longer, has been around longer as a marketplace for comics. And so now that we've been able to tap into that, I think that's where a lot of this unexpected success was is coming from. Again, Mark and I had very modest goals. Two thousand dollars was our only goal that we had. And we blew through it in two hours. I was astonished when that happened because, for example, Black Ops had an eight thousand dollar uh, goal because we had more artists working on it. So obviously that's more overhead. And it took us, I think, two weeks to break that goal. And uh, here we are, and we just passed the $9,000 threshold, and our, our budget is shoestring, which means that, it, yes, I think part of it might be the project itself, but I do want to give credit to the market also playing a role into that, that we just happen to have more eyes on it. You know, I do want to say thank you. I, I really appreciated you approaching me and, and asking me for my opinion. But, you know, that was my, my thought has always been unless Kickstarter or unless Indiegogo are paying you a fee for being exclusive on their platform, why wouldn't you do both? If, you know, if it's the same book, you can do it on both platforms. Why wouldn't you, you know, get the widest uh, possible audience to, to consume the book and, and be out there? And it sounds like it really worked out for you. Uh, Mark, one of the things I, I guess you, you guys – you always like to have a, a premier tier of, of um, uh, available for for your customers, and this time you have like a little standing figurine of, of Common America, and you guys like went out of them in in, in hours, right? What that, happened? That was there? amazing. Uh, so we had two uh, higher tier. We technically have four tiers on our Kickstarter. There's the five dollar tier, which is the the digital PDF copy, and that one's available to everybody worldwide. So international customers can get. At, for five bucks, they can get the digital copy of the comic. Then we have the $10 tier, which is the comic, the PDF, and a sticker. And then above that, we had two other tiers. The highest one was um, a head sketch by Tim on Shikishi board. And that's the one that sold out like immediately. And uh, that's up to Tim if he wants to open up more of those, if he has the, enough hours in the day to draw all those head sketches. Uh, that one sold out fast. People really wanted uh, Tim's original art. Just below that, though, was the acrylic standee tier, which had, you know, the comic, the PDF, the sticker, and the acrylic standee, which we've been selling those at um, at conventions for a couple of years now, and they're very popular. Um, Tim said he got the idea when he went to um, a anime and manga convention, and, like, everybody had those. But when we, we go to comic conventions, uh, not nobody else has them. They haven't really uh, hit the comic convention scene. Uh, they always stand out on our booth whenever we do a comic convention because nobody else has stuff like that. And obviously, <laughs> we were kind of ahead of the curve because uh, those things sold out fast, and Tim had to do a second run on them. And yeah, I think he's going to – I don't know, Tim, are you going to do a third run on acrylic standees for the Kickstarter? <laughs> So it's actually deceiving because the first and second runs are actually the same run. Um, it was one batch that I ordered, but my intention was to divvy it up between two platforms, Indiegogo and Kickstarter. So basically, I'm taking the... I'm, I'm taking the full run, and that's been released, and that's already sold out. So we're in touch with our distributor of, as of the weekend. And as of this video, I can announce that they have said they can make them and ship them within the next two weeks. So this batch that we're going to release tomorrow at noon Central Standard Time is going to be the last batch for Kickstarter. If you miss out on it, you're going to have to go on Indiegogo right after the campaign ends and get them there. But that's going to be limited, and it's a hard limit. If I say that there's going to be 50 available, that's it. I cannot release any more because I want to go into fulfillment immediately after the campaign is over. Okay, so, so we're about to get into to some of the fulfillment and stuff. If people have a brand uh, loyalty to Indiegogo, they will have an opportunity to buy this book, correct? Correct. And I, the only question is the time limit. Kickstarter says that they div divert funds to you in 21 days. Um, I have heard rumors that you have to wait for that money to transfer. Otherwise, if you go into another platform, they will basically just nix your project. Now, um, some creators I've been talking to said that's an urban legend, that that does not occur. I am playing it very safe. Um, 
I will wait for the funds to arrive from Kickstarter before I try anything on Indiegogo. And depending on that timing, we might combine fulfillment, Kickstarter and Indiegogo. That would be preferable. But if the wait is too long, I will uh, start fulfillment on, kick, on the Kickstarter backers immediately. So, Mark, I, I got to ask you a question. You know, what are the risks of, associated with this project? What are the chances that you guys aren't going to have this project, you know, all the art done and, and everything ready for print on time? There is a pretty much a – the percentage is so low, it might as well be zero because the book's already written and drawn, and Tim's already sending it out to print now. So unless something goes wrong, like a tornado hits the, the, uh, the print shop, which is and it's being printed in America uh, right here in the U.S., so no, no uh, coronavirus for anybody – it, it's good. It's good to go. You, basically, what we're doing right now isn't even the campaign isn't even to uh, to fund the book because the book's already made. It's basically just a pre-order to get your copy of the book. Well, that's amazing. So there's the book's already done. It's already you're already ordering the prints. And Tim, I, I just read this. I guess one time you had a variant cover for like a Street Fighter, like a comic book, and there's only two hundred of them in the, left in the world because the truck got destroyed. <laughs> okay, yeah, that happens. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I think Mark was there when that occurred, but basically I did a cover, and it was for Street Fighter versus G.I. Joe, which was an IDW title. And I think we had, was it 1,500, 1,000 or 1,500 copies, something like that. And the diamond delivery truck that it was being delivered on, I think it got hit by another truck, and it exploded. And so <laughs> out of out of all those copies, I think only 500 were left. And half we sold um, and had available at a signing, and then the other half are kind of out in the ether somewhere, I guess. And so it's actually considered one of the rare um covers to have you can find it in the trade paperback of street fighter versus gi joe because it was the only two-page spread that was there but that was like my claim to fame because it was like it's limited but it was limited artificially since the the other like three three quarters of it went up in smoke literally yeah, so you know things do happen <laughs> trucks actually do blow up you know when, when they have comic books on them but we're not anticipating that correct no, we're not. And we have we have them insured too. So if anything happens, <laughs> our printer is very generous and he'll make sure to to rectify that. But I mean, yeah. I, I so Go ahead. crazy things have happened to uh, some of the books Tim has done in the past. Um, <laughs> so Black Ops, um, issue number two from the Black Ops USAGI Buns the Patriot, our first volume, issue number two, uh, Diamond Distributor lost like a whole case of them. And so issue number two is actually really rare because Diamond, instead of just like, they just refunded. It's like, okay, well, we lost your, your comic, sorry. So it didn't get um, as wide a distribution as issue one did. And, you know, sometimes stuff like that does happen. But uh, it's so rare that, you know, a FedEx truck and a UPS truck hit each other and blow up all our comics or Diamond <laughs> just loses a, a crate of our comics. I mean, that stuff is, you know, that's natural disaster tier. That kind of thing almost never happens. Uh, yeah, you know, we're having a little bit of fun because because Tim's had some weird stuff happen to him. Yeah. So I know, um, you know, we have a, a terrific artist in Tim Lim. We're talking to the writer, Mark Pellegrini, excellent writer. But you are not the only talent associated with this book, correct? Who are some of the other people that, that people uh, maybe will know and, and what can they expect from them? Well, uh, Genzo Man is someone I was actually following and I've been following on Twitter for years. And when Tim first showed me, so Genzo Man did the, the colors on Black Ops 2, on the cover for Black Ops 2. And when Tim showed me the cover, even though it was his line art, it had Genzo Man's unmistakable colors. And I was like, Tim, did Genzo Man color that? And he's like, yes. <laughs> but he's, he's so distinct. And he's doing the colors on the cover for Common America, which again is really distinct. You know it's Genzo Man as soon as you see it. And then the back, the back cover is by another artist who did the back cover on Black Ops 2. Um, they go by Cute Sexy Robots. And you can find them on Twitter. And they're very popular. Just make sure you're over 18 before you subscribe. And their art is fantastic. So, yeah, great, great artists that Tim uh, lined up uh, to get uh, guest art on a book. Oh, uh, and um, Carrot and Shtick, who, uh, not to forget about her, she is doing some pinup art along with uh, um, Sasha Paragord. Uh, they're doing pinup art inside the book as well. Um, Carrot's on our, our stream, the Bunder Dome, frequently. Um, you know, you almost forget about her because she's such a good friend. Uh, she also has a cameo in the book and the story itself. And Sasha's doing a, a couple pinups in the book. So, 
you know, a lot of great artists that Tim lined up. You know, I'm glad you mentioned the Bunderdome. I actually meant to, to mention this be, before we got started, but, you know, you and Tim both have a, a great channel out there where you do uh, basically live streams. You, you, you talk about, you know, comic book related issues. You talk about movies. You know, you reviewed like all the issue or all the episodes of the Mandalorian as well. So if you are not subscribed to the, to the Bunderdome and if you like these guys, definitely go over that channel, subscribe, go check out their content because it's really great. Uh, I love having you guys on the channel. I think we've we've covered most of this. Is there anything else that you think the viewers need to know about the project or or how they can get a hold of you if they have if they have questions? So the project is doing really well. I think the only thing that we're going to let your listeners know is that essentially it's a pre-order and not a crowd funder. Um, and some people wonder, well, it's easy for you to say that you can. Um, uh, order your books ahead of time, but how do you do that without the funds being delivered from Kickstarter? And it's because one thing that Mark and I have done is that after every project we do, our intention was always to pass the savings on to the consumer. How do we make the next project better than one before? So I set aside money from previous campaigns to try and not only improve the campaign we're currently on, but to augment the one that comes next, which means I have the funds from previous campaigns to go ahead and do a pre-order of books which means that in a way it's kind of like robbing peter to pay paul but the idea that we are covering it and that when the funds from kickstarter come to us then yes that will cover the the overhead for printing the current project but that means that the next go around we can do the same thing again and again so i hope that people who are listening check out common america and please understand that this is essentially a pre-order for a book that is a hundred percent finished a hundred percent going to get made and a hundred percent going to be delivered to you on time as we promised uh thank you very much did you have anything to say before we head out mark no i think uh tim pretty much covered it uh I'm very proud of the book. Uh, each book that Tim and I have done, I think, has been an improvement on the last. We're just um, – every work we think is our best work yet. So we're very confident and very happy with it, and we think uh, customers are going to love it. Well, I want to say thank you very much to Timothy Lim and, and to Mark Pellegrini for coming on the show, talking about your book. You know, we, we like to talk about comics and other things, but you guys uh, are making your, your own comic books. I'm, I'm very excited to, to see what you guys are doing. Very proud to be associated with you guys. You're, you're some of the best creators out there. You're definitely fan friendly, and uh, I think uh, this book is doing amazing. I, it, I think it's also going to uh, hit very well on Indiegogo. And I'm really excited about The Mangalorian as well. Yeah, the Magalorian. The Magalorian. <laughs> yes, that book is going to be something to behold. And when we start working on that, as we get deeper into the book, I will definitely be reaching out to you to give you some details, which I think you're going to be very happy with. Awesome. I can't wait. Later, fellas. Yeah. Bye. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. I would appreciate it very much. It helps us attract more views for the channel. Subscribe for future commentary, comic book news, and reviews. And don't forget to ring the bell for notifications. If you want to talk comics, movies, and much, much more, you can follow me on Twitter at Wes underscore from underscore TC. With that, Salamat Po, and I'm out.